welcome back to the Vanishing Hour. I hope you all are doing fantastic and had a great holiday weekend. I had myself a long week of grinding to 70 on TBC, but I have officially scraped my way across the finish line. I also finished some online classes I was taking, so I am officially done with all of my prior shit and am diving headfirst into cases for the pod for the summer. If we got them, I want them. Hit up the socials at the Vanishing Hour, or if you're in a spendy mood, check out our Patreon page where I'll be posting exclusive content, polls, and hopefully some worthwhile shit to check out. Fun stuff. But now, let us simmer into our case for this episode. It's one I hadn't heard of prior to researching, which is strange because it's from my home state of California. But here it is. This is The Vanishing of Kristen Madaffery. So let's begin. Kristen was born June 1st, 1979 to Debbie and Bob Madaffery. While she was born in Danbury, Connecticut, her family picked up and moved to Charlotte, North Carolina in 1988 after Bob's job relocated him. And that is where they remained and raised Kristen and her sisters. Kristen was the second of four daughters that they had had, including the oldest, Allison, then Lauren, and the youngest being Megan. It was extremely clear that Kristen was very close to her parents and valued their opinion and respect. They vacationed a lot together and made sure that family time was a focal point for them. Debbie was a part-time teacher and Bob was an electrical engineer, and both were able to provide a comfortable lifestyle for their family. They lived in a beautiful five-bedroom home, and Bob and Deb were very involved parents, with Bob coaching their softball team and Deb being the ultimate soccer mom. Kristen, in my opinion, was kind of like the super child. She was not only beautiful, but she was incredibly smart and sweet, too. She exceeded in school and skipped a grade in elementary, even. She got used to being the youngest in her grade, but was always at least on par with the class, if not exceeding them. In high school, she traveled to Russia with her chorus group, which was an experience of a lifetime for her at that time. She studied hard, and education came easy to her, scoring a 1570 on her SATs. And by the time she graduated from Providence High School, she had earned herself a full four-year park scholarship to North Carolina State University, where she began studying industrial design. Despite her educational superiority, she remained humble and sweet, and many of those close to her said she was such a gentle and naive person, and it was both endearing and at times concerning, as we will see later. She had a serious interest in both photography and acapella, and spent a good amount of her free time pursuing the passions, passions, <laughs> passions she had for both. So when the summer of 1997 began approaching, Kristen started thinking a little more outside of her box in North Carolina. She wanted to spread her wings and sort of travel and pursue her passions a bit and live a little. Bob was all for the idea and wanted to support Kristen in this decision, while Debs, on the other hand, was a little more like, uh, no, I want you to stay home near me, which I feel you on that one, Deb. I'm borderline suffocating with my children, while their father, Shadow, is my counterpart and wants them to live and be free. In my mind, by all means, live and be free, but do it within arm's reach of me, please. That way I can protect you from the evil fuckery of this world and sleep a little more peacefully. My eight-year-old is super independent. He has always been independent. He only comes to me if he's injured in any way or requires assistance. So is my one-year-old. He was born just not giving a shit and is pretty much an old grumpy man in an infant body. It's our five-year-old that clings to me with matching suffocation and I will die the day he tells me, Stop, mom, you're embarrassing me. I fucking loathe the day that that happens. That's super way off topic, though. So back to Kristen. Anyway, Kristen is starting to get that traveling itch and the desire to expand and explore. She presents the idea of moving to the San Francisco area, Oakland in particular, for the summer where she plans to find a job, a place to live, and to enroll in a couple of photography classes at UC Berkeley, which I've visited. It's a gorgeous campus. Apparently, this was something she do as part of her scholarship program. I don't really know how scholarship programs work. I've been too dumb to earn one personally, but that's super cool if you can just enroll at any school on the opposite end of the country and attend on the scholarship's dime. Makes you regret a lot of life choices, doesn't it? So again, Debs is like, I don't really like this idea, that mom intuition kicking in. However, Bob is gung-ho and with a little schmoozing and, quote, arm twisting, 
as one article put it. They were all able to eventually get on the same page and support Kristen with this huge decision. Remember, the furthest Kristen has ever been from her parents was that Russia trip from school. Aside from that, she's never traveled without them. Even NCSU is within driving distance of her family. So the decision to move to the West Coast alone and start essentially from scratch was a very stressful yet exciting one for this family. So on June 1st, 1997, Kristen's 18th birthday, she packs everything up and kisses her family goodbye, kisses North Carolina goodbye, for the summer at least, with every intention of returning, obviously, for fall semester. She touches down on the Bay Area and gets to working on her plan. She immediately enrolls in her photography classes at Berkeley and jumps on Craigslist in its infant years at that time and finds a room for rent in Oakland with four other male students going for about 500 a month. Her family wasn't thrilled at the idea of her living off campus, but they were trying to be supportive of her newfound independence, so they just bit their tongues and went with the flow. After securing her schooling and place to live, Kristen next set out to secure a job. She actually found two jobs. One was working Monday through Friday at a coffee shop called Spinelli's, located at the Crocker Galleria Mall in San Francisco's financial district, a very public and busy area. The other was a part-time weekend job at the San Franciscan Museum of Modern Art. I can't talk today, I'm so sorry. This girl has a drive to travel across the nation to a city you have literally know nothing about or have ever been to alone and to land two jobs, a place to live, and classes to attend in a matter of days is just wild and impressive as fuck. Over the next three weeks, Kristen gets situated into her new life here in San Francisco. She's sightseeing, making friends, doing her photography thing, and just living her best life. School wasn't scheduled to actually start until June 24th, so she was trying to make the most of her free time she had remaining before hunkering down on classes. Which brings us to the day before the semester begins, June 23rd, 1997. Kristen wakes up for her work sometime in the morning and gets ready before heading out to Spinelli's to work her shift. The morning ticks by, and at 3 p.m., Kristen finishes her shift up, clocks out, and exits Spinelli's coffee shop. Now, a few days later, on June 26th, Bob and Deb are sitting at home wondering why Kristen hasn't called and updated them on how her first day of class went, considering it's been about two days now. Bob decides to phone her up, and he gets her voicemail. He leaves a message asking Kristen to call him back and to just check in with him. Shortly after, they are met with a call from a man named Griffin Cherry, a 24-year-old web designer who was one of Kristen's housemates. He tells Bob, I don't know how to tell you this, but Kristen is missing. Bob is fucking down, dumbfounded and asks what happened. Griffin says that none of the housemates nor himself have seen Kristen since she left for work the morning of June 23rd. When she didn't come home that night, none of them thought it was too weird and just assumed that maybe she had a date or met up with friends and was spending the night with them. But when she didn't come home the second night, they contacted police to report her missing and they called him back after he had left the voicemail to let him know. Bob and Deb are instantly thrown into a panic and jump on the first flight they can catch to Northern California. Upon arriving, they head over to the police station to, ask, to speak to the investigating officers on their daughter's disappearance. They are met with the dumbfounding statement that the officers working her case have gone home for the weekend and will return to work on Monday, but that they shouldn't worry. Their daughter's case sounds like a typical runaway case, and it wouldn't make a difference whether it's worked now or come Monday. I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but this is according to Bob and Deb. So... Left with no help from the police until Monday, Bob and Deb set out to look for their daughter on their own. They immediately get flyers made up and start handing them out and posting them everywhere. They head over to Kristen's rented room and speak with her housemates, who reiterate, reiterate, I can't talk, fuck, reiterate that they hadn't seen her since she left for work two days prior. They took one look around and noticed her room was completely undisturbed. Her clothes were in the closet, a photo was sitting on the bedside table, and an unopened letter from her younger sister sat waiting for her. They asked the roommates about what Kristen's typical day looked like, 
just so they could get a better idea of where to be looking for her. They said that aside from her jobs, she would go exploring the ethnic neighborhoods nearby. Because San Francisco is literally a melting pot of many different cultures, and it's very artsy and touristy. They said that she had signed up for belly dancing classes at a local YMCA. Her parents headed out to scour any place they could in hopes of locating Kristen. When Monday rolled around and they had no luck in finding her, Bob and Deb returned to the police station to once again speak to the reporting officer on their daughter's case. This time, they were met by Officer Patrick Mahaney and Sergeant John Bradley, who initially also chalked this disappearance up to a drug-fueled runaway situation, but Bob and Deb pleaded with them to understand that this wasn't the case. Their daughter was not a drug user. She was an academic scholar here for summer classes, and on top of it all, she had moved across the country from home. So she was already away from home, so why run away again, essentially? Eventually, these officers were like, okay, this does seem like a legit case, and they kicked it into gear. Although, by this point, Kristen had been missing for almost a week. The investigators pretty much retraced Bob and Deb's steps and questioned both the roommates and her co-workers and seemed to come up with some interesting information. When talking to Kristen's co-workers at Spinelli's, they got several sort of accounts as to where Kristen may have been headed the day she disappeared. Coworker A stated that Kristen had asked for directions to Land's End, which is like a tourist trap coastal lookout area about six miles west of the mall. Coworker B said that Kristen stated she was headed home right after work. And Coworker C stated that they actually spotted Kristen inside the mall about 45 minutes after her shift had ended. She was apparently talking to an unidentified blonde woman. It wasn't clear if this was a friend of Kristen's or a random person she had just met and was chatting up. Some accounts stated that coworker A said she had asked for directions to Baker Beach instead of Land's End, which is in the same general area, maybe roughly a mile apart, but close enough to be confused in my opinion. When investigators went to talk to the housemates, they were all upfront and willing to help in any way they could. They all gave consistent stories and were never considered suspicious, at least publicly by the police that were investigating the case. An interesting piece of information about Kristen had emerged, though, with this questioning. Officer Bradley discovered that Kristen had a very trusting nature, maybe too trusting. Living in her sort of protective bubble most of her life in North Carolina, Kristen hadn't ever really had a real boyfriend or dated. She wasn't some huge party girl or social life. She had her close group of friends, her schooling, and her family. So in a way, she was just naive by nature and, again, very see the good in people type of attitude. She lacked a sense of street smarts, I guess you could say, which isn't a bad thing when it isn't needed. However, it's a shame too, because I feel like it's almost needed to live in a city like Oakland slash San Francisco. There are some rough ass parts of town and it's a big city full of international tourists and people constantly traveling in and out. This isn't a everyone knows everyone type of place. And she was at a disadvantage because she literally knew no one. Anyway, because of her trusting nature, it led to Kristen maybe making a questionable decision shortly before her disappearance. Bradley is told that Kristen would not only take random carpool rides from strangers, keep in mind this was a time way before Uber and Lyft were a thing, but that at some point in the past couple weeks, Kristen found herself missing the last train to Oakland one night after attending a concert across the Bay Bridge, which is a bit of a journey. She legit considered just sleeping on a train station bench for the night when suddenly a guy that she had met at the concert very briefly pops up out of nowhere and is like, hey, I wouldn't do that. It's sketchy as fuck out here. Why don't you just crash on my sofa for the night? Which theoretically is a very sweet gesture and I can see why any naive, sweet, innocent young girl would just take up the offer. But if you're a hardened, experienced street person like myself, you are immediately in battle stance and threatening the person with the knife you claim to have in your pocket if they so much as come an inch closer. My ass would be finding some dense shrubbery to burrow in for the night if I had no way of calling friends or paying for a taxi. I sure as shit would be like, fuck your couch, fuck you, 